we are going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 17. I also want you to turn to Luke chapter 4. Uh, if you can put a finger on Luke 4. Uh, I'm Fritz. If I haven't met you, I'd like to meet you. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning. Uh, some weeks preaching can be really challenging, uh, especially when you, uh, I'm an emotional person, and so uh, those last two songs are just spot on about the gospel, and uh, they just choke up your, they warm your heart to God's love, and so if you are new or you are uh, not a Christian, we don't want to single you out and put a bullseye on you. But if you don't understand the gospel, I would encourage you to meditate on the words of either of those two songs. Uh, the gospel is so uh, well communicated here. Um, but I do get to, I enjoy getting to preach after great music like that. So, 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, let me... We're going to pick up today uh, in verse 8, and then we're going to read through 16, and we're going to flip over to Luke 4 and read some verses there. Hear God's Word, and if you are a child or act like a child, when you hear the phrase, Word of the Lord or Word of God, you can again this week say, Keep. We're not trying to be funny, but we're trying to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes about itself. So, be ready, children. Okay, here we go, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord thank you, came to him. Came to whom? Came to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So Elijah arose and went to Zarephath, when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty. According to the word of the Lord, thank you, that he spoke by Elijah. Okay, flip over to Luke chapter 4. Going to pick up at verse 20. Luke is in the New Testament for the back of your Bible, if you're new to the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he rolled up the scroll, this is Jesus. Uh, and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, Heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no profitable, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, 
when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Thus ends the reading of God's Word. You may say thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. God, we do believe what Your Word says about itself, that it is the Word of the Lord. And that that Word became in particular incarnate in the person of Jesus. And that You continue, God, to work faith in the hearts of Your people and those not yet Your people when it is preached. Lord, the Apostle Paul wrote to us that How can we have faith without preaching? So we take you at your word, not at the giftedness or cleverness of a preacher, not uh, at the wisdom from the wisdom of our words, but trusting that your spirit continues to speak through your word and through your people. And so do that this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, You may or may not be aware that last Sunday there was uh, a big battle. It was Brady versus Manning number or whatever. Um, Some of you watched more of the rings during that game, and that's fine. (laughs) You're accepted here. Um, But 51% of this nation, in fact the world, watched Brady versus Manning. And that's roughly 53 million people. Uh, That's a big battle that in about 30 years will be totally forgotten and nobody will really care about it. But we have a battle in this passage. We have a battle in what we are looking at for the next several weeks in these passages that deal with Elijah and then Elisha. We have a battle between God and Baal. God versus Baal. The God of Israel versus Canaanite deities. The overall theme that we're looking at for 22 or so weeks, in a practical way, what I hope that you get out of this is how to live in a uniquely dark world. During this time, if you remember, it was not just dark, it was uniquely dark. Dark. The king in power right now, Ahab, it is said, he was unlike any kings before him. He outdid all the kings before him, not in his passer rating, but in doing evil and leading God's people in doing evil. In fact, anywhere you went in Israel, you would find images to foreign deities and to false gods that God warned Israel about worshiping. And now, anywhere you look, you would see these images. And so, what is God up to in this uniquely dark time? One of the things that we have seen is that God does not run from a uniquely dark world. In fact, He is actually at work in it by sending His prophet right smack dab in the midst of it, armed with the Word of God, calling God's people calling uniquely dark people back to Him. And that's what we've seen so far, that God will even call His people back by giving them over to idols and to false gods and images to woo their hearts back to Him. He will even bring a drought of His Word into their lives and a drought in their circumstances to bring them back to 
himself. We'll see that more and more and more. This week, what we're going to see is that God's Word moves beyond the boundaries of Israel to reach a Gentile widow. In other words, the Gospel goes beyond the covenant people of God to reach the Canaanite world. And that's where we're going to start. We're going to start in a place called Sidon. Sidon, verses 7 through 10. Again, look at the passage. After a while, if you remember, Ahab or Elijah had taken the Word of God before Ahab, and then God sent him away because there was no water there. And he sent him by a brook, and he fed him by ravens, and he quenched his thirst through the brook. And then in verse 7, after a while, the brook dries up because there's no rain in the land. In verse 8, then the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, and he says, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. And if you remember back in chapter 16, verse 31, you can look there. Sidon is where Jezebel, Ahab, the uniquely dark king, marries Jezebel, a uniquely dark queen. And where is she from? Sidon. Her dad is actually the king, and he's named Ethbaal. Ethbaal. In other words, Baal is so, so much a unique part of his life that he's named after this God. And what, what, what does God tell Elijah to do? He says, Elijah, I want you to go, as one commentator put it, I want you to go to the mailing address of Baal himself. I want you to go into the heart of Baalsville, outside of Israel. Again, look at verse 8. God's Word came. And this should jolt us a little bit. If you think Israel was dark, the darkness was all around them in the Gentile world, and God says to the prophet, now, I want you to go there, into the midst of the heart of Baal. And what we see here from the beginning of this passage is that God, call it what you want, in the old days it was foreign missions, home missions, now it's called missional. Okay? What we talk about in Sunday school about not just having the church but being the church, God is saying, I want you, I want my word to be missional. My word is to go into this Gentile nation where Baal is king. So much so that his influence is hurting my people. And God wants to save someone right in the heart of Baalsville. God is saying, in other words, this. God wants a bell-worshipping widow to know His love. That message is clear. If you don't get anything from the rest of the sermon, it is so clear, you know how I know it's clear, that God wants a bell-worshipping widow to know Him is because you today and I this week have had the best interpreter, the best commentary on this passage. In fact, I only looked this week at one commentary, my normal commentary I look at, and my second commentary was Jesus. You don't get a better commentator than Jesus, right? If you want somebody to interpret your passage, it's great if Jesus interprets it. And where does Jesus interpret it? We read it in Luke chapter 4. And what does Jesus say is going on here? Jesus comes into the synagogue and He picks up the scroll from Isaiah where it says that God's servant is going to preach the gospel, is going to proclaim liberty to prisoners. He is going to bring good tidings to the poor. And everybody's excited. Man, isn't that hometown guy? Isn't he nice? Isn't he a good preacher? Man, look, look what he went off to college and look at him. He's doing great. And then he says, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And basically what Jesus is getting at is their desire to keep the good news to themselves. Just take care of yourself and your hometown. 
And then he interprets this passage from Kings for us. And he says, this is how God works. God is always from Genesis onward. One of the gospel, his purpose is the gospel goes out to the Gentiles, to the entire world. In other words, that the gospel is not just kept within the confines of the covenant people. It is to go forth. And so he quotes this passage. He says, look what God did. God sent Elijah to a widow in where? Bellsville. And then what happened? They wanted to kill him. In other words, there is something in our hearts, even as redeemed beings, when we look into a uniquely dark world, there is something in our hearts that doesn't want uniquely dark world to receive the good news. Jesus is getting at that. And God is saying, I want bell worshiping widows to know me. It's fascinating to me. I did look at a commentary on the book of Luke, one by J.C. Ryle, who's a guy I quote all the time. It's fascinating to me that in Luke 4, he doesn't even mention the issue of Gentiles, of people outside of God's covenant people. Fascinating. How do we live in a uniquely dark world? Uh, what many people today would call post-Christian America, for example. Um, most people believe that First and Second Kings was actually written during the period of what the Bible refers to as the exile. When God's people were taken out of the confines of Israel and sent into Babylon. Okay? And so you've got a people that are living in a uniquely post-Christian world, right? Does that make sense? In other words, this isn't Israel anymore. They're scratching their heads in Babylon and going, uh, how do we live in this situation? This is not a Christian culture. How do we do this? And in fact, many of the false prophets of that time are going, hey, just hang in there. You're going back soon, like tomorrow. The good old days are going to be restored. The glory of Christian America is going to be restored. And, and Jeremiah says that's not true. In fact, this is what Jeremiah says. This is how we are to live in a non-Christian world. Jeremiah basically says this. I'm going, to, I'm going to quote it and then I'm going to summarize it. Jeremiah says this. This is what God wants you to do in a non-Christian world, in a uniquely dark world. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Multiply there. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. You see what God is saying? How do you live in a uniquely Canaanite God-influenced world? Love your Canaanite neighbors. That's what he's saying. I want you to love your Canaanite neighbors. The temptation in uniquely hard times is to pine away at a time when we think God was more faithful or something like that. And what the Bible is saying is this, that the good old days that we long for, we want to go back to when it was like this. Actually, the good old days are right now. you know why? Because Jesus said between His ascension into heaven and His second coming, He's bringing about His kingdom in a unique way through the church in the world. In other words, whether you, you see it or not, God's kingdom is coming. And we as the church are a part of that. And that there are good old days to come. In other words, as we look forward to that kingdom finally coming, it changes the way we interact with our neighbor in this world.
So the first point is this. God wants a bell worshiping widow to know Him. He wants you and your uniquely challenging, hard situations through your neighborhood, your jobs, all the relationships you have that are difficult. He wants you loving your neighbor. No matter how many Phoenician gods they worship. Okay? Secondly, the thing we see here today is God is sovereign. You look at this passage and you realize that God's power, His unique control, His ruling of all things, and His governing all things is all over this passage. Look again in verse 7. What is it that moves Elijah even before the Word of God? There is no water. The brook dries up. The Word comes and He says, Go. In other words, God is directing Elijah. He's directing all things. You look at this this thing with the jar and the oil being replenished over and over and over. God is showing His sovereign power over those things. But you also see it again in the mission of God for His people. You see it in this idea that Luke 4 brings out that God is sovereign over salvation. Because in sending Elijah to the widow of Zarephath, Jesus says this, and this is sort of what gets people mad. It still gets people upset today. But um, he says, Elijah passed by a whole lot of other people to get to her. He says there were many widows in Israel, but God's word was going to a widow inside him. In other words, there is a warning here. If we looked at this a lot more closely, what we would see is that even though God is calling His people back to Him through this drought, through these circumstances, through taking the prophet away for a season, one of the things that He's doing is He's saying, if you hog my gospel, it's not a gospel anymore. If you just keep it to yourself, it's not the gospel anymore. But the opposite of that is true as well. As you live out the gospel in a uniquely Gentile world, as you share the gospel, the gospel will become more beautiful and more believable to you. Does that make sense? Let me give you a little illustration. So this week, I was trying to pray and think through how God uses the church to share the gospel in a uniquely difficult world. And I was thinking, I was like, Lord, you know, I can't remember the last time outside of college ministry where I was eight months ago that I had the opportunity to just share the good news of Jesus one-on-one with a very clearly person that was either non-Christian or even antagonistic against the gospel. And I just started praying. I was like, God, just open a door, any door, I'll try to bumble through it. And sure enough, I had a cancellation. I went home, and my neighbor, who is in the process of being separated from his wife and is having a meltdown right now, was outside and just wanted to talk. And I had the opportunity of saying, Sholo is his name. I said, Sholo, do you believe in God? Any God? He said, I do believe there's a God. I believe there's a God who will judge me and cares about what I do and you know we'll see that I'm trying to do good and everything will be okay and it was this beautiful opportunity to just talk about a God that takes us to desperate places in order to get our attention there's also we see this sober warning here that God will bless the nations and he's committed to that He will even, in some sense, pass over the elect to elect a foreigner. There's also a sober warning here. That if you are in Christ, this means that God has set His affection upon you and used all sorts of governing circumstances and people in your life to call you to Himself. 
In other words, even though, as Steve so aptly said in the confession of sin, we don't deserve to be here, right? Y'all have heard me say in the past, Presbyterians are really good at that part. We don't deserve to be here. But what's the other side of that? We are here. God wants you here. God wants you in His kingdom. God's love and affection is upon you in Christ. God has chosen you before the foundation of the world. And even though you were at enmity with God, He chose you and blessed you in order to be a blessing to the world. Think about this widow for a moment. She was doing what when Elijah showed up? Preparing her last what? A couple of sticks, a little water, a bit of flour. Son and I are about to die. She had no idea what was coming. Imagine how her life is different now that God sovereignly governing all things sends His Word through the office bearer Elijah into her life and said, Oh no. The depressing, sad, Death, surrounding circumstances of your life are not it. This is not what's governing you. The Phoenician gods that you bow down to, all the images that you worship, that's over. I completely still struggle with this But here's the point. God says, I want you. I've chosen you to be a part of my people. She's in a long line of people in the Old Testament. Whether it's Ruth, whether it's Melchizedek, whether it's Moses' father-in-law, a Gentile that God said, I want you in the people of God. That's a warming, that's a sober, joyful warming of our hearts. That God bless us Again, not to hog that blessing, but to be a blessing to others. The widow did not know what was coming. The last point is this. We see that God sends His Word to the Gentiles. That God is sovereign over who are His people. But we also see His salvation. I don't know about y'all, but I like to read books about hard things in the past. Anybody ever read the book, Worst Hard Time? It's about the Dust Bowl in American history. I love to read books about wars and all sorts of hard circumstances, but I don't want to be in any. Right? Anybody like that? Look at this passage and look at, again, this experience of this widow. She's poor, She's a widow. She's desperate, destitute, probably lonely in some ways. She's thirsty. She's hungry. It basically goes, verses 10 through 12, from bad to verse 13 to worse. Let me again read them. Look at verse 10. He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And this is what she says, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself, my son, that we may eat it and die. That's pretty bad. That's pretty desperate. Her condition, in other words, she has nothing in her hands that she can bring, right? And then verse 13, it gets worse. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake. Here it is. Here's the religious guy again asking for money. Right? This is the guy that a lot of people reject Christianity because of this guy. Yeah, bring it, but you've got to bring it to God first. So I can build my big house and then you just keep whatever you can. 
That's not what's going on. But what is going on is by Elijah's request, what is happening? Her situation, by giving up the little, what my mother would call a smidge, by giving up the little final smidge she has, she has nothing. She has nothing. What is God doing here? It seems odd that Elijah would make this request. This is one of those confusing things that if you struggle to understand the Bible, you look at verses like this and what is God? This doesn't make any sense. In other words, God is just sort of exposing how bad she already had it and making it a little worse. What is going on is that God is calling a desperate widow to see just how desperate her circumstances are and how glorious His provision is. Look again. Look at what Elijah says in verse 13. Oh, and notice even before that, in verse 12, notice the little ounce of faith that has been created in her. In other words, what God is doing through this desperate circumstance and situation is He's calling this widow to Himself. You're seeing someone convert right here. Okay, you ready? Verse 12. As the Lord your God lives. Remember what it said in the beginning of 17 when Elijah goes before Ahab? I'm coming before you as a representative of the Lord who lives. And what we're going to see in the next several chapters is that Baal is not alive. As God versus Baal happens, Baal can't do anything. He can't bring rain. He can't bring an answer, a living well to the, the drought of your heart. He can't address your deepest sinful needs. He can't save you from images. But God can because He's alive. And notice how she's already professing that faith. Okay? My God's not working. My God, I'm left with sticks. A couple little bundles of sticks. Just think, that image is just unbelievably glorious. She has nothing. That's what Baal has gotten her. And yet you see in verse 12, she's beginning to turn to the God of Israel. And then in verse 13, Elijah says this, I know I'm asking you to do something crazy and unlikely and desperate. To give up the last of what you have to an office bearer of God to someone who represents God, who's bringing the Word of God, I'm asking you to do something crazy, but do not fear. Notice he doesn't take the request away. He doesn't say, I know this is going to be really hard on you. It's going to get you to the end of yourself and the end of your Canaanite gods. So I'm just not going to, I'm not, it's not going to happen. Think about the trials. We said this last week, but think about the trials and the droughts that God brings you to to get you to Him, whether it was for the first time or on the go. In Hosea, it says that God will bless us with thirst. He will bless us. He will bring Israel to the wilderness to speak to your heart. In other words, He'll bring you to the end of yourself where you can't rely on any other Canaanite God. Your resources don't work. You're in the wilderness. And that's where He speaks to your heart. How many of you have experienced that? And can share that grace and love with others. That's what He's doing. He's bringing the widow to the end of herself. And He's saying, I know this sounds crazy, but you must give God everything. Let go of all your resources. Let go of the last you have. Empty yourself and God will provide. Then look at verse 14. His word and His promise. Thus says the Lord. There it is again. God's word. The God of Israel. The jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be emptied until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. 
In other words, what he's saying is God's Word is declaring to you that in the midst of your de desperation, I will take care of you. To become a Christian, that's exactly what happens. We are seeing a work of faith and repentance. God is saying you must turn from all your resources and turn to the living God and I will not just fill your cup, I will replenish it continually over and over. As my favorite commentary says, that every day for this desperate widow was the daily drama of waking up and there it was again. The jar is full. The jug is not empty. He did it again. And she's probably a lot like me. He's not going to do it this time. It's not going to happen this time. Yes, it is. Whether it is daily bread and financial, health, whatever it is, God gives us sustaining mercy and grace. Again, look at verse 15. She went, as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to what? The word of the Lord. Imagine if this were you. Imagine if you went to your house, you never went to the grocery store, and every day you opened your refrigerator and the milk jug was just full. Some of us would probably get used to that. Oh, it's just that's just the way it's going to be. It's still a miracle. See, this isn't just to the Gentile desperate widow who doesn't quite know the Lord yet. This is to Christians. Because that's us. We need grace constantly. Every day we need the drama of Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the whole act and drama of redemption that we'll celebrate actually with a table next week. We need that every day. We need renewed in that. We need continual grace. Colossians 2 says it this way, Just as you received Christ, emptiness, nothing in my hands I bring, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This week, if you were here for the budget presentation, Arn said it pretty quick, so you, it might not have sank in. But one of the things I thank you for, and you may not even know you did it, because you might have missed the meeting and didn't vote, but you approved that once a month I get to go see a counselor. I would he said that in front of everybody. You know why I get to go see a counselor? Because I get to go to someone once a month and say whatever I want to say. Whatever's really going on in here, I he may be, may, who knows, he may say that's not the way we're into the truth. But I already had to take this diagnostic test and I didn't want to look at my scores. Because it showed not just strengths, but weaknesses and struggles. And I went, I don't want to see that part. God wants me to see that part. Because He says, I'm going to take you through the daily, weekly drama. That I love you not because of your strengths and your gifts and your righteousness, but because I love to bless desperate widows with the gospel. It's an unlikely provision. Last week we saw Raven providing for Elijah. And now we see this unlikely widow with a couple sticks and a little oil and God using that to provide. The gospel is unlike anything else. It says to you, you must let go of everything in order to receive everything. It truly is the narrow door. And yet the narrow door is truly the wide door. 
Because all, think about this, all the apparent wide doors that say anyone can come at the end of the day when you ask, okay, but tell me about this God that says anyone can come. Oh, He will just judge and He'll just, things will work out for me. Well, when God judges me and He sees how I respond to healthcare.gov for the 40th time, for four hours on the phone on a Saturday when it's beautiful and you want to be outside and they messed up again? I don't think God's going to judge in my favor if that's what He judges on. See, that, that big old wide door is really narrow. Nobody can get in if we're judged on what we do. See, this narrow road, this narrow door that Jesus talks about, really is the wide door. The reason Gentiles, the reason that Canaanite worshiping, Phoenician God worshiping neighbors that you have can get in is because God says, my grace is to anyone that will receive it. They will empty their hands no matter how desperate their circumstances, both spiritually, physically, financially, None of that is what God looks at. If you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, the narrow door begins to get really, really wide open. That's last point, last little application. And we're done. What does this passage say about whom we should be praying and seeking to reach? Well, it definitely says that the church should not hog the gospel, should not just be a blessing to one another, which is a part of the gospel, being a blessing to one another, but also being a blessing to the world. And what it says about whom the church should be praying and seeking to reach is this. Any Gentile, any false God worshiper who wants to be reached. Isn't that a clever answer that you just can't believe I came up with that? Right? In other words, again, anyone qualifies who wants to be qualified through Christ. That's whom the church should be reaching. Who and whom are passed over is not our business. Deuteronomy says the secret things belong to God, but the revealed things belong to us and our children. And the revealed things are go and make disciples of all nations. Because we have a God who did not avoid, ignore, He does not speak with a jarring voice. He speaks through Jesus the Word of God who sovereignly brought about our salvation, not in our means by just throwing Him over here. But by sovereignly ordaining that He would go to a cross so that our emptiness would be filled. That's the Gospel. Let's pray. God, thank You for those of us who are in Christ. As Steve said, we do not deserve to be here. And yet in Christ, we can gladly jump for joy claiming the work of Jesus on our behalf. That You do not love and accept us. You do not forgive us based on what we do but that the Lord Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father. And when we, the living or the dead, are judged, we will stand firm in Christ, secure in His work. God, continue to save us from Phoenician gods and images that do not deliver. They only lead to emptiness, and a couple sticks and a little oil. God, would You lead us to the One who fills the jar and the jug every day and gives us exactly what we need both in Christ and mercifully daily bread. In His name we pray. Amen. You may stand and we will sing together.